Um, yeah, so I'd certainly like to, first of all, thank you for the invite and to James for organising everything. Um, I'm going to tell you a story today. Kevin said earlier that uh, he has a reputation for being critical of quantum technology. I like to think my reputation has been aggressively pragmatic. <laughs> I'm only interested in actually having stuff built. I don't build it myself, but I want to see it built. So this is a story about something called a spin battery. And the reason I'm telling the story today is that uh, there's some really interesting lessons um, for the quantum battery field about the difference between the, the mathematical structure or the idealized model and actually things we want to put in cars. And we talked about that a bit this morning. And this is, I'm really talking about electrical work. I'm talking about something to put in cars. But of course, there's going to be some problems with this story, which is why it's a cautionary tale. Um, first of all, to this audience, I probably need to talk about what a topological insulator is. Uh, because some of you have, have done condensed matter in the last 10 years and know, and those of you who haven't done condensed matter in the last 10 years probably don't know. Um, it's a typically a material, an insulator or a semiconductor that has a large spin orbit coupling, which means that it has edge states and they're topologically protected edge states. So you can think of it as a chocolate bar wrapped in aluminum foil. It's conducting on the surface, but insulating on the inside. Yeah? Um, what's really cool about it so here is an example of the band structure. This is kind of the idealized picture from a review article. This is actually the numerically calculated band structure from, from done by a student in my group. And so this is the conduction band and the valence band, and that's the gap. But you see these edge states. And these are these topologically protected edge states. You can really think of them as running around the edge of the material or the surface, just like you would in a quantum hall effect. But this is an intrinsic thing that comes from the type of material. And what's really interesting about this is that on these edge states, you have spin momentum locking. So the charge carriers going one way have spin pointed in one direction, and in the other direction have the opposite. So you get this direct correlation, or in fact entanglement, between the spin state and the momentum state. And this leads to a whole bunch of interesting bits of physics. Uh, this was work done with the, the Fleet Centre, which is trying to build um, low-power transistors out of these kind of materials. But here I'm talking about using it to store energy. So there's this proposal, which is not ours, from a few years ago, where they looked at what happens when you have nuclear spins inside the material and they interact with the, the charge carriers. So you've got an electron coming in with some spin, and you've got a nuclear spin pointed in the opposite direction. They interact, they swap their spin state, and because of the spin momentum locking, the charge carrier now goes back the other way. So it's a spin-dependent scattering process. But the really exciting thing is, if you then send another charge carrier in, like the first one, now they're pointed in the same direction. So it just goes straight past and goes looking for another nuclear spin which is pointed in the opposite direction. So the idea here is that as you, if you apply a voltage, you can slowly polarize all of the nuclear spins in the material just by this spin-dependent scattering mechanism. And so you can see why I'm talking about real batteries. We've actually got currents and voltages. And as you apply a voltage or, or uh, inject current over time, you start to spin polarize the material. And this got people very excited, not least of all because in this paper, oh, hang on, in this paper, um, they estimated the amount of work that could be done in the charging or extracted in the discharging cycle, and they got this expression here. And this N is the number of nuclear spins. And we've seen N squared a lot today, yeah? And a lot of discussion about N versus N squared. And so this N squared got people very excited. But then, more interestingly, in this paper, they go a bit further and they guess sensible, and they are fairly sensible numbers for all of these factors. And then they get something like 10 megawatts per kilogram, which sounds really good. But I wouldn't have given my talk title the title I gave it if this was actually the whole story, yeah? In fact, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on a yacht somewhere. Um, so 
But before we get too far into that part of the story, this effect really does exist. Here's an experiment. They did it. The group in Purdue did it. Um, here is a topological insulator with this ridiculous alphabet soup of um, elements. This is bismuth telluride selenide. And this has a topological edge surface state on it. They put some gates on. They drove current through in various different ways. And if you look over here, so this is at 1.6 Kelvin, this is at 45 Kelvin, they're seeing a voltage induced across the contacts which is time dependent. And look, this is 10 hours and this is 40 hours. So there's, for those of you who know solid state physics, there's very few things other than nuclear spins that can last that long. So this really is, they were starting to polarize all the nuclear spins. And that starts to look like a sensible battery, yeah? Now, of course, this is only at very low temperatures, but we're in the early days of developing these topological insulators. We're only just getting into gaps of 100 or 200 Kelvin, but there's no in principle reason why we can't get to three, four, 500 Kelvin with the right materials and the right doping and all that kind of stuff. That's a huge area of research. So the temperatures this experiment is done at is actually not too much of a concern. And there's a sensible possibility that this effect could still be realized at room temperature, which again, you've got real currents, real voltages at room temperature, very exciting. Of course, as I said, there's some problems. Um, there's two big things to note here. One, I already talked about this N squared in the, in the work done. And it, to achieve this expression, there's actually an optimal charge discharge point. And we've already heard about optimal charge times, but here I'm talking about an optimal charge voltage. You apply an optimal voltage which maximizes the rate or the power, the rate the work goes in or out of the battery. And it turns out that this expression relies on choosing this optimal point properly. It also relies on the nuclear spins all being independent. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this optimal point, it turns out that that n squared factor, one comes from the nuclear spin density, but the other comes from the voltage scaling. The optimal point scales with n. So when you put it into this expression, you get an n squared, but it's coming from two different sources. One is coming from the independent spins. The other is coming from the fact that every time you increase the number of nuclear spins, you also increase the voltage to get to the optimal point. And that you can only do for so long. These things really are insulators or semiconductors. So for a typical gap of 100 Kelvin, which that's one of the materials that we really know how to use right now, this means that you, the voltage must be a fair bit less than nine millivolts. So yes, you get an N squared right at the start, but as we saw in a heap of plots, the N squared very quickly flattens out into an N type scaling. And this is the, actually it might even be worse than N because if you go larger than the gap, um, you start generating excitations in the bulk and, and all the topological protection starts to break down. So you really can't, there's a maximum voltage that you can apply, and that limits this scaling capability. But the other thing, and so, and so that kind of immediately puts a bit of a dampener on this story. Um, this, are the nuclear spins considered independent? Turns out to be a whole other thing, so we can look at that. So if you've got some channel, quantum spin hall insulator is another name for a topological insulator. We've got some channel which is storing energy in the nuclear spins, but of course those spins can also see the spins in the substrate nearby or the other parts of the topological insulator that aren't part of the conducting channel. So we have to think about where, which spins can be seen by the conduction spins and what are they doing. And so that turns out it introduces a whole bunch of complications because for instance, these spins you're polarizing can couple to those ones and the energy bleeds out into the rest of the material. Now on the surface, that's not too bad because you're still storing energy. But the problem is as you bleed out, the effective splitting gets less and less. And so it's kind of like you're losing energy because you're projecting it into spins with different splittings. And so you get all these kind of spin-spin um, interactions where everything is bleeding out through the material. And so now this simple picture where we had everything being polarized is no longer valid. Um, and more concerningly, this is a dipolar interaction. So dipolar interactions, quadratic or, or um, cubic with distance, 
or inverse cubic with distance. And so that means that whole process of bleeding out takes longer and longer as you get to further and further nearest neighbors. So we end up with very slow charge discharge cycles, even at the optimal point. So all of these technical complications actually completely change the story. Um, here's a numeric, my group does a lot of numerical models of these kind of messy uh, realities. Here's a model of the uh, topological insulator. Those are the edge states there. These are the spin projected ones when you put a voltage on. This is the change in the spin projected charge density as a function of some defect there. So you see that it has its, we've purposely put it in the channel so it's maximally coupled, and you see it occupy, it kind of disrupts a finite region. This has two effects. One is you have to, you, you're predominantly polarizing the spins that are in that region of space. That's what this peak means. This is kind of how strongly it couples to a nuclear spin. But also, there's a finite region of space where if you bring the nuclear spins too close, they no longer act independently, and you no longer get this idealized polarization. And so we, we kind of looked at this is bringing them closer and closer together. You get significant deviations from the standard independent model. So all of this puts a maximum density, which then again limits the maximum energy storage capacity. And you can take all of these ideas and actually do a bit of a sanity check, pick a completely different system, which is hyperpolarized carbon atoms in diamond. People have looked at this for M NMR, MRI type applications. You can just do a back of the envelope calculation and you get something like millijoules per kilogram, which is exactly what we get for the topological insulators. So it's a similar order of magnitude, which unfortunately is very different to where we need to be if we want our Teslas to go further and faster. With that, I will finish. The point here being that nuclear spin polarization in topological insulators really does store energy, but not a lot and not necessarily very quickly. But it is a real device. Like, it's, we can connect wires to it. It's, uh, we don't have to solve the charge to photon conversion problem that we have with a lot of the quantum battery schemes. Um, as usual, the pesky laws of physics get in the way. There's no free lunch. but as I said, there's lessons to be learned here for quantum battery research in general. And all of this work was predominantly done by Jesse Bakers and a bit by Sun Ho. Thank you very much. Questions? I've made everyone sad. I'm sorry. <laughs> David. Uh, thank you. Uh, that was a very clear uh, presentation, but I just wondered um, how far from the surface current layer of the polarized spins do the nuclear spins polarized as you move away from the surface? Yeah, so, so that, how far from the aluminium foil does the chocolate polarize? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's it? the trick. There's, there's a characteristic uh, penetration depth associated with a topological edge state. So there's a, there's a, it depends whether you're talking about 3D or 2D. But in a 3D topological insulator, it's the entire surface state, and then it, there's an exponential decay in, and it's of order nanometers, typically, for most of the materials we care about. Um, now, here the idea would be you layer. You have a, hetero junk, a heterostack type structure so that you maximize the energy density, but that is one of the concerns, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, there's a microphone coming. Um, Max, uh, it's exciting uh, I'm, because I'm materials, chem uh, materials chemistry, materials background. So um, the, if we can uh, limit the separations, the nuclear spins and the electron spins, so you're within a very certain distance. I'm not sure you don't have the unit there. So what, this electron or something. So that in that case, uh, you think, do you think this is still possible for... Um, look, look it's yes. Yeah, so, so the the um, plot I showed is renormalized. So every different material has a different characteristic length. So the calculations are done with within those units, so that we can take the calculations from one material to another. But as I said, it's of order nanometers or so. Um, the, there really is some technological possibilities there. Um, the question is, what is the correct application? And so maybe it is when you need to store a small amount of energy for a 
brief period of time inside some other circuit. Or one of the other things that Fleet is looking at is having uh, transistors with large sub-threshold swings so that it takes very little energy to switch them from zero to one. And there's certainly possibilities there. Um, so there's actually, it's quite exciting, but we have to be a little bit careful of n versus n squared is essentially my moral. <laughs> Do you have questions? I have one. Mm. So, Jimmy, you're talking about topology. I'm sorry. If I start thinking about nuclear spins and things like Gary Mars died, I can see super radiance in systems like this. Um, how are you going to get in and out of it? The trick here is the spin orbital locking. Yeah. We don't have such a thing in Gary Mars night. No. So, so you would have to do some. You'd have to have spin injection somehow. Or but to a, the, the Lambo mo one of the modes. One of the bosons that they can have. Yeah, yeah, but then, then actually you're starting to get into nanomagnet territory. Yeah. It looks like a magnet yeah. rather than. Yeah. 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 yeah.